I'm here with Lex Amore of the Biomimicry Institute. Lex, thank you so much for being here. It is a pleasure, Matthew. So I'm curious how you got into the work that you're doing now. So I'm wondering if you can give us a brief history of you and your journey to arriving at the Biomimicry Institute and what interested you in working with nature and systems in this sort of way. Yes, it's probably one of my favorite topics because I feel like it relates to a lot of people, especially where we're at right now. So about a decade ago, I was in my early 20s and I moved to California and that's where I discovered climate change. I went through my whole undergrad and I never learned about what was happening with the state of our earth. And when I found out, I had been working for a PR firm at the time that represented big banks and lawyers. And one of those lawyers, I got to put a, a client in front of me that was representing the fracking industry. And that's how I started doing research. And I was like, wait, wait a second. This is, this is wrong. This doesn't feel good. And so I started absorbing as much information as I could and ultimately told my team I didn't feel comfortable working on that client and somehow skirted unemployment. They wanted to give me a raise and hire me full time in a different capacity. And it just felt wrong. And so they were they were wonderful humans and ultimately gave me a really long stretch of time to find another place to work. And that last week that I had, I found this sustainability PR firm that only represented clients that were trying to make a better impact on the world. And over the next few years, I worked with amazing clients, everything from sustainable architecture with William McDonough and Cradle to Cradle to renewable energy and all kinds of um, healthy, safe building products and really looking at these solutions. But I still felt hopeless. I, at the same time in my personal life, I was absorbing every piece of content I possibly could about learning. And I started to really get kind of angry about why, why weren't people doing things? Why, why is this still a problem? If we've known about this for decades, I just did not understand. And there was one day that I came across a talk from Dana Baumeister and she had painted life on a calendar year, starting from 3.85 billion years ago, all the way to having Homo sapiens come in right before midnight at December 31st. And she started talking about this concept of biomimicry. And if we were to study these organisms that have sustained life the, from that are still present and alive today, that they've actually solved a lot of the design problems and the same challenges that we're facing in regenerative ways. And for the first time, I felt hope. I felt like there are solutions, there is a way. And in that process, it invited me to reconnect with this bigger space of coming home to the natural world and recognizing that lesson that I learned in third grade biology that was like, you are part of the animal kingdom. Somewhere in that time, we lost sight of that connection. And so immediately I enrolled in the master's of science program with Arizona State University. I studied directly under Dana. I was a teaching assistant for her for multiple semesters. And I felt like I was part of the positive change. Eventually, I learned about the Biomimicry Institute and that they were looking for a communications director. And so being able to combine my decade of experience in communications and then my newfound love and passion for studying the natural world and redesigning everything that we touch, it was the perfect fit. And so now I'm at this nonprofit organization where we're dedicated to basically I get to use my education and give it away for free. I get to help uh, our education department where we are working with youth educators to teach young people, actually it's teach teachers how to teach young people how to use this kind of critical thinking skills all the way up to startups that are really making nature inspired design come to market. 
And here I am. Now I get to talk about this all the time and, and be able to find that kind of hope in a daily basis, knowing that the solutions to our problems are right here. They're just outside and we just need to learn how to ask the right kinds of questions to figure out some really cool strategies for solving these design problems. Mm. So as I understand it in a nutshell, biomimicry is taking inspiration from nature who, as you said, has really figured out how to survive and how to thrive in the world and modeling our own creations and systems that we're a part of after that, because all the wisdom is there in front of us. Yes. And I, I love the way that you synthesize that because I would hope that anyone listening to this would be, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. Like, why haven't we been doing that forever? And the truth is, it actually has been done for a very, very long time. We just somehow, there's a big part of society that lost sight along the way. So indigenous peoples have been looking to nature and honoring the land and the air and the water for as long as we've been around. And with the industrial revolution and agriculture and just the changes of the practices over a lot of years, we shifted our focus. And I think part of that shift disconnected us from that natural world. And there's still a lot of people alive today mostly indigenous tribes that are still practicing this and honoring the land in this way. And we have so much that we can learn from them as well for what they've, this wisdom that's been carried on. And so biomimicry as a term was popularized by Janine Benyus in 1997 when she wrote the book. And what it really did was put a academic design methodology behind this approach so that designers or really anyone, because we're all designers, can go through this methodological approach to really solving a problem where we're going through the scoping and then the discovering the solutions from the natural world, we're creating something and we're evaluating it to say, does this create conditions conducive to life just like nature does? So it's not necessarily a new way of being, but the scientific approach here that we're taking is a step-by-step -step process. So through this, we honor the design methodology, but then we also pay a lot of tribute to the philosophy of looking at ourselves as part of the natural world and coming back home to this reality that you know, we kind of lost sight of along mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. So I definitely want to get into some examples of biomimicry and and designs that have been inspired by nature, but you mentioned the philosophy and the science, and I'm wondering if you can set things up a little bit for people here by talking about what we mean by systems, um, mm -hmm. because this is so important to designing it, to, to biomimicry itself. So what's a, what's a complex system and, and why does it matter for how we create things in the world today? It's a great question. It's a great focus because ultimately that is the missing piece for a lot of the approaches in the design world today is looking at this idea that really everything is a system. And what we mean by that is everything is interconnected. Everything is reliant on the parts that makes up the whole. And the whole is, is part of this deeply connected system that goes beyond the systems. So, you know, we could look at earth as part of our solar system as maybe the most that we can conceive beyond us, but let's start with a system that's really close to everyone that is listening here, which is our body. It is an incredibly regenerative system. So we know that the only constant in life is change. And we can see that clearly through our bodies and the way that they function tissues are regenerating, cells replace cells, a full bone can be regenerated in 10 years. This is an immaculate system that self repairs and it's intricately connected to its external environment. And wherever a human lives, that's gonna be dependent on really what's happening on the inside and how they're a part of this outside. And it's, it's just fascinating to realize that we're actually more microorganism than we are human with trillions of microorganisms outnumbering human cells by 10 to one. That's insane. A lot of people have been talking recently about 
the gut microbiome. This is a system and it is really heavily influenced by the food that we eat, the toxins that we're exposed to, what's happening with our mental and emotional health. And this all impacts the body's functioning. And with the pandemic being top of minds for a lot of people still, because let's be honest, we're not out of it. This, this is a great chance to look at, for example, our immune system. And this is a generally inactive system that is waiting to spring into action when a major infection comes in. But really, in fact, it's, it's never at rest. So knowing what triggers our immune system response could actually open up opportunities for moderating that response, such as developing interventions that can change the level of triggering molecules in our bodies. And we, like our immune systems, can use these triggers to help diagnose the presence of dangerous infections. So this is where we bring in biomimicry. A medical bandage designed by the University of Bath, for example, was inspired by the immune system response to dangerous microbes. And so they created this, it has capsules filled with fluorescent dyes that are embedded in it. And so when toxins from dangerous bacteria are present, they break down the capsule walls and release the fluorescent dye, creating a quick and easy way for doctors to detect infections that are forming on a wound. So if we expand beyond the human body, how can we design cities to function like forests or buildings to function like trees? If we were to think about the design thinking, how is it that in nature, there's really no concept in waste? Everything is a resource for something else. And so when we're talking about this interconnectedness, we're coming back to this idea that everything has an influence on everything else. And if we're able to look at this ahead of time in the design thinking process, we can look at unintended consequences that are gonna ripple out into other systems in which it's going to have an effect on. It's a really, it can get really big when you start thinking about it. And then we look at these you know, wicked challenges that are facing it when it comes to climate change and all these systems are playing together. And so where we use biomimicry and where I get a lot of relief from is it's looking at one aspect of one part of the system, seeing it as part of the bigger whole, and then taking actual steps in route to being able to create a more regenerative system that has feedback loops and that is adapting to changing conditions, that it's evolving to survive. It has all of these principles that studies the way that nature has done things effectively, and then using our design to basically just fit back into the natural world. And that interconnectedness is what really holds all of this framework together because we can see that it all matters. Everything has a purpose, everything has a role. Every individual listening today has an impact on multiple systems and has systems within their own body. And if we start thinking like that in our everyday interactions, I think we would be more deeply connected to that present moment and recognizing our place in the whole world. In an ideal world, like if you were to take another example, let's say architecture, the way that the design process right now is, it's very linear. You have someone has an idea, they sit down at the table and say, you know, they're going to hire all these people to do the work. You get the constructor, um, the architect that comes in and designs it. You get a landscape architect, you get a building engineer, you get, um, you know, the people that are actually going to construct the building. What would happen if all those people in the very, very beginning sat down at a table, brought in a biologist and a biomimic, and they started looking at some of the unintended consequences that may happen down the road. So they start designing with safe materials from the get-go. They look at the ecosystem in which that building is going to be placed. There's a really popular example of a building in Africa that mimicked the way that termite mounds use passive airflow to keep a constant stable temperature that's habitable inside that that termite mound. And so they mimic that for the building. So you got really extreme heat in Africa and they don't use air conditioning. Like this is, this is looking at the place and then designing for it, but it takes that kind of intentional 
thought process and having everyone at the table at the beginning to really talk through things. And if we were to do that for everything that we designed, we'd be able to just avoid a lot of unintended consequences in the end. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some of your other favorite examples of designs that are based on this concept of biomimicry? What's what gets you, you know, so excited to to share with other people? Oh my goodness, there's so many. Uh, so let's see. One of our so we have this program called the Ray of Hope Prize, and we work with startups to be able to bring in these kinds of early stage entrepreneurs and help give them the tools and the resources that they need to help bring get over that um you know silicon valley of death is what they call it and so spintex was actually our winner from last year and the year before was econ crete and i love this team so much um i actually it started with just the founders and their passion for scuba diving and being in the natural ecosystem in the ocean and they learned they started seeing that you know, when you go down and um, are able to see concrete, for example, the way that they are restoring a lot of coastlines right now is they're backing up a lot of concrete. And usually what you see is you see this smooth concrete that is made um, with heat beat and treat measures and some toxic chemicals. And also, just when it's formed, it's so smooth that nothing can form on it because that's not a natural thing in the world. And so what Econcrete did was they went into these ecosystems and they started saying, how do mollusks and oysters and how is coral formed and how are all these intricate structures built upon each other? And they started mimicking, they found a new admix for concrete that's more sustainable in the way that it's produced. And they started designing these structures. So what they were doing is mimicking form and system as part of these designs. And so what they came out with is high performance, environmentally sensitive concrete products for marine infrastructure projects. One of the most recent was in the San Diego Harbor. And basically what they're doing here is over time, you see these images and the organisms are just fleeing to come back and being able to build upon these structures. So they need less maintenance. They get stronger over time and they're solving multiple challenges for these different areas. Uh, another one that is inspired by uh, an ocean organism that I love is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these really colorful rainbow mantis shrimp, they have these clubs and the impact of these clubs is so intense. It's actually, the pressure is stronger than a 22 caliber gun. So how is it that they're not cracking? And how is it that they can beat these? Like it literally boils water as it punches. Like it's insane. But how is it that they can maintain the structure? And so what it came down to is there's it's actually an architecture of the materials and it's this weaving that's done from the club design. And so helicoid industries mimicked this architecture in to create this lighter, stronger composite material by applying this internal architecture to the design. And so imagine planes being lighter, cars being lighter, wind turbines being uh, more durable in their ability to generate power. What that ends up being is less energy is used in the design making process and the actual use of it. And it's just a really cool story that comes back to like, it just makes sense. Then um, there's so many, like I, I clearly love color. It's everywhere. I have these flowers literally all over my house. But if you look at colors everywhere, and a lot of it is unfortunately made with toxic dyes, and that has repercussions for when you're breathing it, it has repercussions for when it's wet and it gets into our waterways. And so Cypress Materials actually learned that butterflies, they don't use, you know, you see these iridescent, beautiful colors all over these butterfly wings. They don't use pigments. They actually use structural color to manipulate wavelengths 
and it's a trick on our eyes. And so what Cypress did is they created a tunable structural color inspired by the Morpho butterfly that uses zero dyes or pigments. It literally sprays on and then you can tune what color you want. There's so many more. There's water purification devices that are inspired by aquaporins that are they're 100 times more efficient than current technology. Um, Sharklet is also one of my favorites because I love sharks. I think they're amazing. And there, there's this uh, company that mimics the way. So if you look at a shark skin, they look really smooth from the surface, right? If you compare that to a sea turtle, for example, the older a sea turtle is, the more it's like grown on all this algae and it's got all this stuff on its shell and it's back and it just looks really slow moving through the water. Sharks don't have that luxury. They have to have quick abilities to eat their prey and also not be dragged down. So they actually have these little nano bumps all along their skin called dentricles. And so that prevents microbes from forming on their skin. And so Sharklet mimicked the actual form of these, and they've designed everything from catheters to handles on hospitals. So you imagine you know, you've got viruses, bacteria that can't build up just because of a form structure and everything to like yoga mats and baby products and anything that you could really imagine putting a film on that's going to create a safe barrier for these microbes from growing. I could literally go on and on, Matthew. Like there's so many examples, literally everything that we touch and design can have some kind of inspiration from nature. But where I want to make a big distinction and it's, so what we're talking about, you said context is really important. That is so inherently true. When we're talking about biomimicry, we're talking about function. And so function in that context, how does nature do X? How does nature create color? How does create nature uh, create materials? All these different functions. And then we ask nature how it is done. But with biomimicry, one of the things that we stress really, really importantly is that it's not just about mimicking that form or that process or that system. It's also about the other two essential elements. So emulate is that design abstracted from the natural strategy. But then you have ethos, which is our moral responsibility and recognizing that, is this creating conditions conducive to life? Is it really fitting into the ecosystem? Is it actually having a regenerative function? Because it is our responsibility to look at how it is impacting the existing environment. And then there's this idea of reconnect, where it is basically saying, we are imperfect humans we are animals living in the animal kingdom on this planet on this earth and it's a sense of belonging it's coming home to the natural world and so a really great biomimetic product or service is going to have all three of these elements embedded in their entire design philosophy so if we were to look at the wright brothers as a great example here they looked at birds and they mimicked the way to fly and they got us into the air. But it wasn't but a few years later that we were using that design to drop bombs. That's not biomimicry. It needs to be considering these applications and the side effects so that we're not causing more harm in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a couple of questions about some of the examples you gave? I'm curious about some of these designs. The shark skin, the emulation of the shark skin, is it the material that repels the mic? It's not the material, it's the structure of it, right? The, the structure, the way so that it the would be the form. Are, the form of it. Does it mm -hmm. matter what material they're using? Let's say they're designing a catheter or something to, I don't know, that a patient can you know, put on a wound or something like that. Does the material matter or is it simply the structure of the material is enough to repel microbes? The structure and the form is going to be that aha moment, that design, amazing abstracted philosophy here that we're looking at. But it really does matter the material because you need to, as part of the scoping process with biomimicry, you're looking at the performance and the function for that as well. 
And so if it's not like there's all kinds of considerations for, especially if you're looking at the human body, um, the unintended side effects for that. So Sharklet, because they are looking at all three essential elements of biomimicry, they have looked at, is this safe chemistry? Whether or not that's going to aid the function of preventing microbes, that has to come from the creative process and really evaluating the performance. But really from a bigger perspective backwards is everything matters. There is, if we're not looking at the chemistry of the materials, if we're not looking at the energy that's put into it or the end of use, we're missing really big opportunities for really creating something that is what life would do. And so we need to consider that. But when it comes to the function, it is the form mm -hmm. of those little bumps. Mm -hmm. How far out do you think we are from seeing some of these products being used in a more mainstream way? Um, and what do you think gets in the way of, I know this is a field that's still, you know, kind of maybe in its earlier stages, but what do you think gets in the way of seeing more of these products actually like in front of us on the market and in use because they seem to function better and obviously they they're they have a better environmental impact as well it's a great question because there's on one end if you were to look at a bunch of academic journals and research papers you're going to find all kinds of terms from biomimetics to bioinspiration and there is a lot of um traction happening right now. There's a lot of people looking to this as a way to improve these uh, problems that they're facing in the design world. Even BMW is working on it. Microsoft is working on it. Microsoft has a director of biomimicry now. Nice. There is like, it's incredible. So it is, it is getting mainstream, but you're right. It is lacking in terms of there's, I still every week have the bio, bio what? conversation and then dig into that and every time at the end of that conversation they're just like yeah that makes sense we should why is this why doesn't everyone know this and i think in some ways the term biomimicry is a little um challenging to understand so when i talk to people i am talking about how do we ask nature but it is actually getting a lot more recognition a lot of people are seeing it as a way to save money and create more efficient designs. But the reality also is a huge limitation is that scenario that I brought up earlier about everyone sitting down at the design table in the beginning, that's not done often because it's expensive, because it brings people into the place where they're not yet working and it's more time, it's more resources from the beginning. What they won't recognize until later is that it's actually a better payoff in the end. Mm -hmm. For example, in San Francisco, there's a building that's literally sinking. It's insane. What if we had everyone sitting at the design table at the beginning of that and looking at the, the ground, looking at all these implications that are going to matter, they'd be saving a lot of money and less risk that they're in right now. But when I go into and talk to, let's say, CEOs or um, companies, I'm not going to go in there talking about sustainability. They're not interested in that. There's a lot of CSR reports coming out, yes, and there's a lot of greenwashing, yes. But they don't want to really hear about that. So what I'm going to go in is saying, you're going to save money, you're going to save time, you're going to save energy, you're going to save resources, and you're going to have a really cool story that goes along with your design that better impacts the community, that gets people excited, and that makes an actual positive difference. So we have to change the conversation. And this is why conversations like this are so important, because the more that we share by word of mouth, the more that we recognize that there are examples on the market right now, they're everywhere, then it gives people that encouragement and that hope to see like this is happening. Last Friday, we had um, a climate emergency declared. And this is not something new. Many countries have already been doing this for years. They're saying that um, the mainland US, this is going to be the coolest summer ever again. There's all of this doom, there's all of these threats, there's 
a lot of things you're seeing gas prices extreme like there's so much if you really start to pay attention there's so many challenges that we're faced if we put ourselves in a normal human that's just trying to put food on their table and keep a roof over their heads or for me i work with people that have um struggled with chronic pain and fatigue and illnesses um what do you how do you inspire those people to make more sustainable choices or to start thinking about where they're buying their food or if they're designing their lives in a way that's creating conditions conducive to life when they can't when they're struggling to get out of bed in the morning mm-hmm. like that's where i see the reality of we have all these different situations going on in the world and it's hard for a lot of people and this isn't even talking about social inequity and you're afraid to go down and walk down your the street because of the color of your skin it's just still a thing that's today this is the reality that we're faced with and where i continue to come back and find hope is that if we can meet people where they're at and be patient and accepting and recognize that like we're never going to go back to where it was. We're not trying to go back to the pre-industrial revolution. We've created so much chemistry in the world that we never can. And this may all feel doomsday-ish, but I'm actually still really full of hope because if I can help that one person get outside into a forest and they feel 15 minutes of relief because they got to settle their mental and emotional struggle, that's something, that's something worth celebrating. It's something worth celebrating to have researchers be exposed to this kind of education that might just have one, one change of them not going to work in a just, dis- you know, destructive extractive industry and instead going and serving in a way that's going to empower uh, communities to build better sanitation, for example, like there's so many opportunities that we have in front of us. And when, if we were to get real and start having more conversations that are not hiding behind masks, I think that a lot of this would be exposed in a much better way. And part of that, again, comes back to when I'm talking about biomimicry, yeah, there's this design philo- there's this design methodology that helps us solve problems. But one of the best things that happened when I was in the master's program is it changed my entire perspective of life. I look at everything as part of the natural world. And so with my communications background, what I hope to be able to do is meet people wherever they're at and bring this kind of thinking so that they feel empowered to know that if they can just design the choices in front of them right now that seem attainable, if there's more access to education, if there's more opportunities for researchers and startups to support this kind of thinking, and if corporations should, can just get on board with recognizing that the short-term gains are going to hurt everyone in the long run, we can actually make some real changes happen. Hmm. Yeah, that principle of having a perspective large enough to consider the long-term impact mm-hmm. of your behaviors is something maybe that we're missing in our culture now. It's all about the short-term gratification of things mm-hmm. from the individual all the way up to corporations and the collective level. So I appreciate yeah. that. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit. You mentioned sharks. So I have to ask you about this because I learned something about you, uh, which is that you do free diving. Yes. Where the sharks are. So (laughs) um, tell her, I just find this so fascinating. So can you, can you share with us um, a little about this hobby and how you got into it and what the experience is like being underwater for you? Absolutely. I love, I love free diving. I love the ocean. Uh, I about a year ago, I found a way to basically heal um, about seven years of chronic pain after a back injury. And that made it really challenging to walk for a really long time. And so before I had gotten to that place of healing, because I'm doing great now, 
uh, I, I struggled with gravity. And so the ocean being able to float and take off the load was a way to feel some relief. And living on the islands, I got into a group that was doing this thing called free diving and I had never heard of it. And I went out with them and just watching them go down to the bottom of the ground seemed amazing. And I was instantly fascinated. And so I went through the certification, ended up getting my level one free diving because it's all about safety, because this is something that is, it is dangerous. You're literally taking one breath and there's a whole way to do it right in terms of your body form and just the way that you breathe and they call it an adventure sport but really it's the most zen sport ever because you have to be as calm as possible because the more that you have stress the more cortisol that's produced the more oxygen that runs out of your blood so you actually really have to slow down and I use it as a metaphor for all of my life because it is the more that you feel that you need to speed up, that's the best time that you need to slow down. Mm. And so being able to do this, um, going down to the bottom of the ocean floor, where that's at. So my personal best is about 60 feet. Um, and I usually do shore dives though. So maybe it's closer to like 20, 25 feet. And it's just one breath that you go down there and then you just hang out and something happens down there where fish go about their business, um, being able to see sea turtles, white tip reef sharks, seeing them in their natural habitat without them feeling like there's this weird human around is an incredible experience. It helps me slow down and, and in a way that I'm so curious about what they're doing down there. And just that my whole perspective changes and I, I, words can't really express the kind of feeling that happens when you get to this kind of a place. But if you can imagine, a lot of people just see the top of the ocean and this is blue, blue water. There's so much happening below the surface. I have no desire to go to space. I feel like there's so much available to learn right here in our ocean. So much life, so many intricate relationships and dynamics. I don't know if you've ever seen my octopus teacher. If you haven't, you absolutely yes. should. Yes, Is that not just amazing? Being able to see this guy go through and we got a sneak peek into what it's like to be an octopus, a life. You show up every day and you get to see this organism do their thing it's humbling and inspiring and it for me it connects me to that world deeper and gives me a different kind of sense of purpose and I think just the nature of being underwater everything just gets quiet unless again it is whale season in which case it is very very loud and then it's a whole different kind of awe because you hear these songs that are traveling over miles and miles uh, and just wondering, like, what are they saying to each other? <laughs> Lex, how long are you down there for on one breath? Uh, it depends on where my body is that day, where my mind is at that day. My longest is four minutes and 23 seconds. But I'm usually not down that long. Um, usually just a few minutes. Uh, but again, that even just two minutes down under the water feels like an eternity mm -hmm. it's it's amazing it, do you ever reach a point i know when you get to a certain depth um you're because of the the pressure you're more likely to black out has that ever happened to you or have you ever started to feel you know worried that you're gonna lose consciousness uh no luckily that's the biggest part of the safety and the training program and why I worked with a specialized coach to be able to learn this kind of things, because not only that I want to be safe myself, but diving is essential to do together. And so I wanted to be able to save my, my people. And that's another reason why the dive community is so tight is because your lives are at line, but really what's ended up, what's happening down there is when you 
it's if you manipulate your breathing when you go down then that's when you have a better chance of blacking out so it's all about being really in tune with your body this system that's happening and paying attention and not pushing limits to a place and it's a gradual buildup um i've never gotten deep enough to where i'm worried about my internal organs but you know, every, once you go down every about 10 feet or so, you're going down an entire atmosphere level of pressure. Mm. And so equalizing is really important because you're essentially, it's kind of like an airplane, except the opposite going down underwater that you're equalizing your internal pressure. But what's, there's so many different physiological things that happen. Um, they actually, there's this thing called the mammalian dive reflex, which is fascinating because it means that humans still have capabilities of being a marine organism and so when you're under the water and you go like so the best thing to do when you're first getting in is go down a few times and start getting your body acclimated and you actually kick in this reflex that the body says like oh we're underwater now so we're able to better hold breath and be able to just function from the internal um system that's that's happening right. and I had this amazing rare moment where I was diving one day and the, a pod of dolphins just came swimming through and immediately I'm like, I'm a dolphin now became a dolphin swimming with these dolphins. And it's just this different kind of awakening that happens when you see these dolphins looking at you and they're like playing with these leaves and you start playing with them. And then you, again, comes back to like, how do they learn? How do they communicate? And it's just so humbling. It's like, there's so much that we can learn from the natural world. So whether or not it's getting into the ocean or going out into the forest or figuring out whatever's close to you and just quieting the brain thoughts that are happening and observing. Mm -hmm. There's so much wisdom that can be learned and this sense of like, I don't have to have it all figured out. I can be flawed and everything is flawed and it's all okay. Hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, I'm curious if if there's anything that you do in particular to prepare yourself to go down. Are, are there any sort of breathing exercises or anything that you do to prepare yourself physiologically so that you can hold your breath longer? Yes. Um, well, there's different kinds of stretches um, in terms of opening up the chest um, I meditate every day and journal, and that's more of a psychological approach to the calmness, uh, limiting caffeine, not eating on a super full stomach, but having enough energy at least to get out there. And then I definitely do a lot of breath work, um, both in and out of the water. Uh, but it's, I think it would be more of a lifestyle where you're changing the confidence that you have to be able to take on this foreign environment and know what your body is capable of. And this level of awareness is not something that it's just done the day or the morning of it's every day. It's a whole way of looking and being and living in this world so that when it's time to get into the water, your body is ready and your mind is prepared. Mm -hmm. But I've known there's times when I'm like, I'm, if I have any doubt, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go out because there's something inside that's telling me in listening to my own intuition and whether or not it's my body or my mind doesn't matter, but there's something that I need to be curious about and cautious about. And I'll take that time and that space to do that. So knowing what, just from your ex experience, being underwater, um, someone who has really been intentional about feeling connected to nature and then also your intellectual knowledge about nature and the world. What do you want other people to know? If you could, and obviously you've shared lots of information with us already, but in a nutshell, what, what do you wish people knew about the world that you feel like you've been able to connect with? Mm, I, mm, that's a great question. Because I will say everything that we've talked about today is it's still just scratching the surface. Like there's so much depth, whether or not it's talking about biomimicry, whether or not it's talking about like just design thinking in general, uh, the connection to the natural world, mind body. Um, there's so much that I love talking about and getting deep on. But if I were to really 
take a step back and say, if anyone could walk away from this, what I would want them to know is that you're enough. You are enough as you are. You have so much to offer this world. It is not about having to transform everything and definitely not about transforming it overnight. If you can take one step toward self-love, I think that it sends a ripple effect out into loving the rest of the earth. And we, it can be daunting if we think about the challenges that we have in front of us. And on an individual level, everyone is struggling in some capacity. But that's okay too, to know that you're not alone because everyone is struggling. And if we can just learn from each other and learn from our experiences and come back to recognizing that we matter and that that is a, a just baseline starting point. I think a lot of people would be better well equipped to then want to make better choices and to connect with each other. My name is designed by myself. <laughs> I was not born with my name. I legally changed it and my middle name too to be Vida Amore because I wanted to live a life of love. And that's my intention. It's my purpose. It's what I would hope to be able to spread and to know that this isn't special to me. This is inherent in everyone. Everyone is capable of coming back to this place of connection because of that inherent truth that we are all interconnected. This is a long, long thing to take away, but it is, I think it's worthy. And I use affirmations a lot to help me ground in this this concept because there's a lot of tools that we have available to us in the day to day but coming back to context looking at your life where do you have an influence where do you want to improve it what are your strengths already and start from there and then everything else we can work with thank you for saying that that was wonderful is there anything else that um, we haven't talked about that you wanted to share today? I have been really fascinated with the mind and the power of influence. And I, I use biomimicry to mimic neuropathways to be able to essentially heal from trauma, emotional trauma, physical trauma. And I don't think that it's a conversation that's talked about enough it's gaining some traction in terms of like mind body connection but especially with everyone being a little bit more attuned and aware of their situation I think it's really important for us to start considering how we have these different aspects of ourselves mental emotional physical and spiritual health spiritual I'm not talking necessarily about religion although if some people out there have a faith and that's what they want to rely on that's great I'm just talking about the fact that there is a well-being of something that's greater than you you are connected to something that's bigger and having some kind of essence that you believe in I think can help and so when we're looking at being able to balance ourselves and look at the way that the brain functions and reprocess some of these patterns that are have been just practiced for so long like what you practice that you get really good at which is why talking about biomimicry comes so easily to me because I live it and I breathe it and so I'm fascinated fascinated by this approach of studying the mind and then being intentional about how you want to redesign your entire life and that's I, I think it's a great um, it's a great bridge to those that are struggling to just deal with their own lives today. Because for so long, when I was in that climate grief, I really wanted everyone to just change. I was like, I, I'm going to dedicate myself to changing the world. And it was like, that's so, like, so many people are, are like that, that they're just like, I just want to change the world. I want everything to change. And I want to be this, like, force of change. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying where I found in my journey is if that's not really meeting people where they're at. 
And so where I am now focused on is helping people heal themselves so that they can then heal the planet. And we do this through looking at biomimicry, but we also do this just through this deeper reconnection with the whole body experience. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that anyone listening, if they you know, gravitate to any of this thinking, there's so many trains of thought out there in the world that you can explore and you can tap into whether or not it's needing to just embrace this idea of breathing and taking the free diving exercise to just do that at home. You can imagine the power of the mind is incredible and we can create our entire realities. Obviously, given some context, it's going to be easier for others. But for a lot of those in developed countries and those that are fortunate and privileged enough, there's not a ton of excuses for not being able to slow down and look at your life and how it's having an effect on everything else. Mm -hmm. Again, this theme of systems and the interconnected, like that's the underlying takeaway for everyone is just to know that you're part of something bigger. And because of that, you also, you make an impact on every level. And on the other side of biomimicry, um, deeper in terms of the practice, if you are, if you have a family, if you are an educator, there's so many tools available for bringing this kind of design thinking into your curriculum or like the 30 days of reconnection. You can do that with your family. I designed it to where it could be eight or 80. I want it to be accessible. Um, or if you're a startup and you're working on this, like we, the thing that you walk away from at the end of the Ray of Hope Prize program is connections. You've got access to investors. There's, we'll help you with science communication, but also the top um, startup gets $100,000. So there's a lot that we're working with there. And then if you're just curious and you want to explore how awesome nature is and start just getting your creative mind going or explore, you know, how an octopus is able to change color, all these different strategies. We've laid out this massive database called asknature.org where you can literally go in and you can type in, how does nature do this? How does nature communicate? You can learn from dolphins and their peer-to-peer -peer learning. You can learn from all different kinds of organisms. And it's a great place to start. If you're just wanting to learn a little bit more, there's essays on there about um, different kinds of stories of the impact of how humans have connected with the natural world, how to navigate the sea. Like there's all kinds of really cool resources available there. Very cool. Very cool. Where else can people learn more about biomimicry, the Biomimicry Institute. And if someone wanted to get in touch with you and they had some questions, how can they potentially reach you? Yes. So biomimicry.org is going to be your go-to spot in addition to Ask Nature. On the main site, biomimicry.org, we've got resources. We've got more about our programs. We've got, if you just want to find a group of people that's near you or that's studying a issue that's close to your heart, like a problem that you flooding, for example, um, or plastics, we have the global network. And so there's a bunch of groups around the world. You could find your people, connect virtually or in person. Getting in touch with me, the best way would just be a shout out to hello at biomimicry.org. Send your questions, send your ideas. Uh, we've got obviously social media platforms and Instagram is the go-to place in terms of learning about Ask Nature. Um, we've got newsletters that are dedicated to our audience that really help bring that kind of education and curiosity directly to your inbox. Um, and then I would say the videos. We have a bunch of really short animated videos uh, that we've created for our Ray of Hope Prize teams. And they're two minutes long. And they just really, I love the way that they illustrate, here's the problem that we have. Take it, mm, toxic chemicals in the fashion industry. Here's what nature is doing awesome. The discosoma coral creates this vibrant pink and magenta colors. And then we have a solution. Werewolf is replicating the protein that is made in this coral. And you're designing non-toxic, safe alternatives to fashion. And you just it, it just paints it out. Like you can see one for the helicoid shrimp. So you can actually see like what we're talking about here. And that's a great, I think for me, it's a great way to learn. It's a great way for others to just share this kind of information. Um, there's just a wealth of resources available online. Amazing. 
Well, thank you so much, Lex Amore. Thank you for being here. This was a very enlightening conversation and uh, I really appreciate you and appreciate your time. I appreciate you, Matthew. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.